Our last storyteller for tonight is Scott Sanders. He moved here from New York and he's still adjusting to the tranquil Bay Area, uh, just the tranquil Bay Area. He says the restaurants close way too early here. He's obsessed with and <laughs> they do, don't they? Wow. Yeah, um, he's obsessed with Apofina. Did I even pronounce it? Apofina. You guys know what that was? <laughs> so Apofina is finding meaning in unrelated events. Please give a warm welcome to our last storyteller tonight, Scott Sanders, with his story, Doppelganger. So you know what a doppelganger is, right? A double, a lookalike. Some people believe everyone has one. I've been mistaken uh, for a celebrity on more than one occasion. In the 1980s, it was Lou Reed. So I was able to get into Danceteria and the Mud Club uh, for free a lot. <laughs> is a doppelganger an evil twin? I'll leave that up to you. There are many, many stories behind this. In, uh, I've always had, I've always been a literal lightning rod for unusual events. I've been kidnapped two times, once in China and once in the former Yugoslavia. I was under arrest during a violent coup in West Africa and the State Department had to intervene to get me out. I had Bob Dylan on my lap in the New York City taxi cab. <laughs> and I gave up acting when uh, my dog became an acting superstar. <laughs> and oh yeah, I've been hit by lightning. So the following story isn't anything unusual. It's sort of the same pattern of unusual stuff happening to me. Around 2005, I left the center of the universe, New York City, and I moved to the... <laughs> <laughs> the tranquility of the Bay Area, and that's when it began to happen. I could be skiing in Tahoe, I could be in random cafes, I could be uh, the DMV in a hot tub, and people are coming up to me and saying, you know, you look a lot like Robert Downey Jr. And people, granted, this is 15 years ago, and people are saying you actually are wondering if I am Robert Downey Jr. I was online at a ski lift in Tahoe, and this woman sort of stealthily comes up to me, and she gets real close, and she leans in and says, I know who you are. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not gonna say anything. I was in LA around that time, and I'm walking around Venice, and this guy asked me for an autograph. And I said, who do you think I am? And he said, Robert Downey Jr. And I said, but I'm not Robert Downey Jr. And he said, but I, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted an autograph. So I said, okay, you want an autograph? That'll be 20 bucks. <laughs> and 20 minutes later, there was a Twitter storm that quote, Robert Downey Jr. is a short, cheap, total dick. <laughs> that charges money for autographs. <laughs> the same week I'm in LA, I'm walking out of a bar in Hollywood, this guy who's obviously drunk, he follows me out, and he is also insisting I'm Robert Downey Jr. and he wants an autograph. And I tell him I'm not Robert Downey Jr. and it goes back and forth. So I said there are two ways we can deal with this. Uh, the sort of New York, no, the California, the tranquility, Northern California tranquility response, I, I say to him, perhaps there's another way I could better explain, make it easier for you to understand that I'm not Robert Downey Jr. The alternative is the more direct response where I said to him, look, I'm not Robert Downey Jr., goddammit, and if you insist, we're gonna have a serious fucking problem. Around 2008, I'm at a concert at, at the Greek Theater for the National, and there were two or three, like 18-year-old women, about 20 or 30 feet away, and they keep pointing at me and laughing and pointing at me, and finally, one of them yells out, Robert Downey Jr. 
And I took a beat, and I yelled out, Michelle Obama. <laughs> anyway, this kept happening. And every time somebody said, you look like Robert Downey Judy, I would say to them, do I look like, you know, it's Hollywood glamorous movie shots, or do I look like, you know, after he's been busted at 5 a.m., <laughs> And he's been doing coke and meth all night, and it says jail mugshot. And when there's some hesitation, <laughs> I begin to think I should like seriously reevaluate my own personal care program. <laughs> but around 2009, I don't know if it was you know the stars aligning, no pun intended, but it like reached a crescendo. And I like to think of myself as enterprising and creative. And uh, I was also egged on by some friends. So when we couldn't get into a trendy Bay Area restaurant, they uh, convinced me to call as if I was Robert Downey Jr.'s agent. And I said, listen, Robert's in town for one night and one night only. And he is really looking forward to dining at your fine culinary establishment. Is there any way you could accommodate Robert and three of his friends? And we did this three times, and every time we did it, it worked. <laughs> so a half hour later, we're outside a restaurant in downtown Oakland, and I'm nervous because, you know, there are some consequences, potentially. <laughs> but we go inside, and immediately, like the Red Sea parts, effusiveness abounds. Everyone from the uh, maitre d', the waiters, the chef, the uh, diners, the bartender, everyone wants me to be Robert Downey Jr. more than I do. <laughs> and it's mind-boggling because each time we did this, I un misestimated, underestimated the commitment of everyone else wanting to be Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> the only way I can explain it, it's like, remember when you're like four, year olds in a, four years old and you're in a play group, and one of the kids says, I'm a pirate. And without hesitation, everybody goes, you're a pirate, we're in. Well, it was just like that. So we're escorted to a prime location table and chairs are rustled, shuffled around. And the meal commences and it's going okay. I'm keeping my paranoia at bay. When all of a sudden a very tall, good looking, super tanned uh, male model type approaches the table and he sort of gets through the invisible force field that I had. And he comes up to me, and he puts out his, his arm, his hand, and he says, Terrence, from Tilda's party. So I take a beat, and I go, Tilda's party? Terrence, of course. And we shake hands, make five seconds of small talk, and he goes back to the table. At a certain point, the chef comes out, and he's like windmilling his arms around. He's very triumphantly, and he's bringing special dishes for us. And there are two things I have to remember when we do this. One, I can't drink, because Robert Downey Jr. is on the wagon. <laughs> and the best part is I can't pay for it, because if I used my credit card, the gig would be up. <laughs> so to counter my sobriety and to get back at my friends, I buy drinks for eight people in the adjoining tables. <laughs> much to my friends who's uh, moonlighting as my manager. And uh, the meal proceeds, everything's going fine, it's time to leave. I tell my friend who's my manager that you better leave a big tip, otherwise there's gonna be another Twitter storm. <laughs> so we leave the restaurant, everybody's pretending not to look, but everybody's looking. And we get outside and there are two paparazzi there, there are two photographers. Because every time we did this, the restaurant dropped a dime because they wanted the free publicity. So it turns out the two photographers doing, are doing it part-time. They're uh, Cal film students. So uh, my friends go on their way. I, tell, I say to the two photographers, let's go around the corner. There's a, a loading dock behind Sweet Bar Bakery and you take the photos there. They take a couple of photos. And then we spend five minutes arguing over which Robert Downey film is the best Robert Downey film. <laughs> and I insist it's Charlie Chaplin. And they insisted that it was Iron Man. And I couldn't convince them otherwise. So I leave, they leave, I leave. It's a warm July night, it's about 10 o'clock at night. 
and uh, maybe six or seven blocks from the restaurant, when all of a sudden this guy comes tearing down the street, you know, stops on a dime right in front of me like road ru runner, and he's like sweating profusely. And he says, I don't want anything, I just want two minutes. Uh, I work at the restaurant where you just at, and he proceeds to tell me that he and his wife are huge Robert Downey Jr. fans. In fact, he proposed to his wife right after seeing the episode on Ally McBeal where Robert Downey Jr. sang Every Breath You Take. <laughs> and then he proceeds to tell me that his life fell on hard times where he had dr drugs and alcohol problems and he split up with his wife and he lost his job and he was contemplating suicide and he uh, got inspired by watching Robert Downey Jr. go from being a Hollywood star to being busted in jail and then working his way back and being even bigger than before. And he says, I have to get back to the restaurant and he reaches out for a hug and he whispers in my ear, you are my hero. <laughs> and he runs back to the restaurant. And I'm thinking, holy cow, how often do you get to meet your hero? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the night went from, you know, frivolity to some level of authenticity. I'm not quite sure what it was. And I... Uh, I walk home, I get home, and I uh, take a moral inventory of the whole situation. <laughs> and I decide to put me and Robert Downey Jr. to bed. And I think about it, it's amazing. Like, like, when you're famous, strangers think they really know you. And I wake up in the morning, and I flip up my laptop, and I immediately went to San Francisco uh, Chronicle, because on the back page there was mentioned that Robert Downey Jr. was at Pecan last night. <laughs> and then I go to Yelp, because there's always interesting stuff on Yelp. There were three comments, but the most interesting one was, apparently a diner was offended that the waiter told him that he's sitting in the same seat that Robert Downey Jr. had sat in less than 30 minutes before. So, at that point over coffee and a beignet, I decide no more doppelgangers. And then I make a list of all the restaurants I can't go back to. <laughs> Thank you.